Can the government fix the crisis in the NHS? The sacking of Tory chairman Nadeem Zahawi and the children drawn into county lines gangs. This is Politics Live. Joining me today, Conservative MP Bim Afalami, Shadow Immigration Minister Stephen Kinnock, Times Radio's Aisha Hazarika and writer and broadcaster Inaya Falarin Iman. Today, the Prime Minister defends his decision to stand by but then sack his party chairman. What I've done is follow a process which is the right process. Integrity is really important. This isn't just about one individual. This is about right at the heart of government, a government that is just mired in sleaze. What we need to do is integrate what is happening in the community with social care much more closely with what is happening in the emergency departments. Can the government fix the crisis in the NHS with their recovery plan? Fix the cladding or we'll stop you building, construction firms are told. We'll ask this flat owner if it will solve the problems with flammable cladding that have blighted his life. And the children drawn into county lines gangs. To see your child's face, twice the size of what it should be, no mother should see. He should be treated as a victim, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Let's start with the story you heard there in the headlines. Here's the BBC News take on it. NHS plan £1 billion for hospital beds and ambulance fleet. This is the government's and Rishi Sunak's NHS recovery plan. That amount of money will go towards thousands of extra uh, hospital beds and hundreds of ambulances uh, to be rolled out in England over this year in a bid to tackle the long emergency care delays. There'll also be an expansion of virtual wards to tackle the backlog. The opening question uh, to the panel today, starting with you, Bim, is that going to fix the NHS? Well, I think it's going to be pretty important. Any, every MP knows, anybody who's been on a hospital visit recently, as I have, knows that capacity is a significant problem, probably the number one problem in the system at the moment. 5,000 extra beds is pretty significant, mm. and by any stretch of the imagination along with extra ambulances, but that increase in capacity, and they're physical beds, these will be, and they're not going away afterwards, you know, these will be there embedded in the system, more capacity is really, really important. And, you know, you could criticise and say we, we should have had, mm. uh, we should have done this a year ago or two years ago, or whatever, but ultimately we are where we are, we know we have a backlog, we need to increase the capacity, we're doing that, and I think this will make a big, big difference. Do you think it'll fix the crisis in the NHS? No, it won't. Of course, all investment is welcome, but um, it's a sticking plaster solution. We need much more fundamental reform. Uh, one thing we need to do is abolish non-DOM status so that we can claw back the £2.3 billion that's being used in that loophole, invest that in record numbers of recruitment of uh, for 7,500 doctors, 10,000 nurses that Labour is promising uh, would, we would use that money for. We also need a long-term workforce plan which addresses the huge issue of vacancies mm. uh, in the NHS. We've got 160,000 care workers missing from the system. And when people can get more uh, salary, a better salary working uh, in a supermarket, for example, than working in the care mm. system, well, that's, they're going to vote with their feet. So right, there's well, much more fundamental issues that need to be, resol be resolved so, here. OK, Stephen is right that we need a workforce plan, and there's one coming in the coming weeks and months, so and the government's announced that. So you're right, workforce is critically important. But also, be very honest with everybody, extra capacity of this amount is really critical to absolutely all the other issues that you're talking about. And yes, of course there are other things to do, but, but you've got to take an issue on its merits. Do you, surely you support extra 5,000 beds in our system? Well, I said all extra, extra investment is welcome. That was, that was the first sentence of my answer to Joe's question. But I think we just also need to remind ourselves that the Conservatives have been in power for 13 years. So coming forward with plans now that should have been way ahead of the game. I mean, when you build resilience, 
by building the strength in your mm. system before a crisis hits. And what we've seen because of COVID is how exposed we were because of the constant erosion of our public services. And we are now paying the price for 13 years of Conservative incompetence and indifference. This policy is a policy for England only. Um, Labour is in government in Wales. There are also severe problems with the NHS there. Uh, do you apply the same criticism to Mark Drakeford and the government there in terms of a lack of reform? Well, of course, the UK government fundamentally holds the purse strings for the NHS in Wales. It is devolved, so the NHS, the, the Welsh government takes decisions about how best to deploy the limited resources that we get from the UK government. But when you look at the statistics also, if, for example, we include diagnostics and therapy in our waiting lists. So one of the reasons that the Conservatives keeps trying to... Um, the, weaponise the NHS in Wales is based mm. on um, statistics where they're comparing apples and pears. So let's actually have an honest discussion about the resources that are required across the UK. Uh, and of course, in Wales, we're also dealing with uh, relatively high levels of poverty and relatively high levels of industrial sickness. Well, you mentioned retention and you have said that that is going to come along a plan in terms of tackling the workforce because it seems it's critically important. Um, uh, for you, Aisha, first of all, The Guardian story, one in four NHS staff could quit within five years because of pressures. Um, and the King's Fund are saying that this extra capacity is welcomed, but they don't necessarily have the staff to actually deliver it. And look, the workforce it is a huge part of, of this story. The NHS absolutely needs, it needs more investment, it needs more beds, it needs more staff and it needs more critical infrastructure from, from crumbling buildings to things like cancer scanners. And one of the things we have to be honest about, yes, this investment is welcome. Yes, anything that alleviates the pressure is good, but we're playing catch up because during the austerity years, the NHS got put on the equivalent of a starvation diet. Then we had COVID and now we have this kind of big sort of everything coming together, this, this very imperfect storm, if you like. But look, some of the ideas in this are, are, should be looked at and they're quite interesting. So, for example, virtual mm. wards. Most people would, if possible, like to be treated at home. They don't want to go into hospital for a various number of reasons. That is good, but you need staff to do it. The, the NHS, like mm. many public services, is a labour-intensive operation and if people are leaving in their droves because they're getting better wages working in a supermarket it's not just about investment for beds they're going to have to invest in their staff. I mean is this also going to be a verdict on Rishi Sunak he said in the question and answer session he's on a hospital visit in the northeast that if we can deliver um, I mean how contingent is his premiership on these things working? Well, I think it would be uh, really important for most ordinary people. I think, as Stephen I rightfully mentioned, that actually we've had 13 years of Conservative government. And this does feel like a plaster. Oftentimes, these issues are actually deep-seated and structural, whether that's the kind of staff shortages, but also the fact that we have an ageing population. And so a smaller proportion of the population are going to be paying for a larger proportion. And whether or not that's being taken into account about the long-term decisions of the NHS isn't really obvious. But I do think for a lot of people... It, it, there's only now been a shift in the conversation about a root and branch reform before in the country. Any time we try to have a mature conversation about the NHS, it was often said that, oh, well, you want to go for a US-style model and everything's going to be privatised. Actually, now we're seeing that our current model isn't necessarily bringing the kinds of uh, effective health care that people are paying for. And therefore, we're going to have to look at how we... Uh, shift and reform in order to actually improve care for people. Let's have a look at Nadim Zahawi, the former party chairman for the Conservative Party. He was sacked uh, on Sunday, yesterday. Uh, the papers are covering it like this. The Daily Telegraph, Prime Minister sacked Zahawi without a fair hearing. Uh, the Guardian has this headline, a serious failure. Zahawi forced out over tax claims. That was the investigation held uh, by the ethics advisor. Uh, in the Times, Zahawi acts as Sunak gets tough on standards. And finally, in the mirror, Tories uh, engulfed by sleaze, rotten to the core. Um, did Rishi Sunak act decisively or did he dither? Well, it was pretty, deci pretty decisive, hence why certain people are now saying, oh, you know, he was axed without enough time to make his case. I actually think the Prime Minister did this in the right way for the following reason. On one hand... It was, it's really important that you have a fair process. If there are media headlines, and sometimes they are not necessarily as true as may appear at first glance, 
it's important that any minister or politician in that position has a chance to make their case, set out the facts. That chance was given to Nadim. He gave those documents and the information went to the ministerial advisor on ethics, and then quickly a decision was made by that. Uh, the report was done by the ministerial mm. advisor. The prime minister saw it and acted incredibly quickly in his judgment that, that Nadim should go. I actually think fairness, but also decisiveness, makes sense. And I don't want to see a world where just because there are media headlines, yes, in this instance, the prime minister made the right decision, and it's right that Nadim goes. I want to be clear about that, but. You don't want to see a world where there are media headlines and, right, that means somebody has to go just because it's inconvenient politically. I don't think that's a sensible way to operate. And I think you've got to have that balance. Stephen? It, I mean, we've got a hopelessly weak prime minister who's trying to lead an ungovernable conservative parliamentary party. There's just scandals and sleaze whichever way you look. Uh, Sunak knew it was a matter of public record that um, uh, Zahawi had paid a penalty. That was information that came out in January. And you have to say then... We cannot have somebody in the Cabinet who was putting himself forward to be Chancellor of the Exchequer whilst he was being investigated by HMRC. Why do you need an ethics advisor to give you that very basic fact? It's about morals and ethics and who is suitable to be in our Cabinet. Yeah. And the fact that Rishi Sunak allowed this to drag on for so long is simply because he's trying to manage all the factions in his party. And once again, we have the Conservative Party putting party interests ahead of the interests of the country, ahead head of right. public of standards in public life and they should get out of the way and let Labour take over because they are clearly not fit to govern. Ben? Unsurprisingly I don't agree. Um, <laughs> it, it, what this is really about it's about Labour now playing this game of trying to suggest that absolutely everything and everybody is doing something illegitimate or wrong and that is just fundamentally not the case. Nadim had a dispute with HMRC mm. That dispute played out. He ended up paying what the tax that Whilst was due. Whilst he was Chancellor well, of the then, Exchequer. Of course. Well, hold on. I mean, we've, already, we've, already determined, we've already determined that was wrong. But the full facts of that were not known to anybody else. But we did, know, so, we did it, know about the penalty, though, didn't we? Yeah, Ahead of the ethics advisor being asked to carry out an investigation. But the... By Zahawi's own admission. Well, the point here is that a lot of things were not declared on his ministerial... Um, uh, lists of conflicts that every single minister has to sign up to. The, when the full facts were known, the Prime Minister acted decisively. That's why it was... And that, by the way, is exactly what the Ministerial Advisor on Ethics did say. He did not say, oh, no, look, you know, this, all this information's been there for six months. You know, the Prime Minister could have acted. That yeah, isn't I what he said. I just find what? it extraordinary that you're trying to defend this, Bim, because no, no, what, well, no, what I'm, message I'm does it send to the well, country when the person who is Chancellor of the Exchequer is being investigated by HMRC. He was, of course, at that time, you're talking at about. At that time. Yeah. And he still thought that he was the right man for the job. And then the, the, that all came to light, at least in January, although it's widely reported in the media that Rishi Sunak knew a lot more about this case back in October when he appointed Zahawi, that we can say to the country, it's OK, we can, as a government, tell you all to pay your taxes, but we've got a guy who's Chancellor of the Exchequer who is facing a penalty for not paying mm. his. It uh, is. It, 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 the well, the hypocrisy of it is just jaw-dropping. I, I have been very clear that Nadim was right to leave the government. But the point here is you're trying to make a wider point about the propriety and ethics of the government as a whole, and that I do not agree with. The Prime Minister, when presented with these facts, tried to act. And he acted as decisively as he could well, once those facts were known. Let's have a look at uh, Nadim Zahawi's response, because in his letter, Inaya and Aisha, he says, I am concerned, however, about the conduct of some of the fourth estate, the media, in recent weeks. In a week when a member of parliament was physically assaulted, I failed to see how one headline on this issue, the Noose Titans, reflects legitimate scrutiny of public officials. I'm sorry to my family for the toll this has taken on them. I think we can just show you the headline that he's referring to um, in the eye um, in just a moment on the Noose Titans. What do you make of him blaming the media, the fourth estate. There it is, Zahawi tax storm, the noose titans. Yeah, I mean, I think most people will know that that was just a phrase. I mean, you can argue or whether or not that was appropriate, but it was clearly a phrase, not, not one that was genuinely intentional. And I do think it is worrying to see someone that is the former chancellor essentially accusing people of smearing mm. him. And 
some journalists have said that he had put his lawyers on them. That is incredibly worrying. And all of this in the context of a cost of living crisis, where most people are struggling with their bills, to see somebody um, in government effectively not being, not actually being held to account. And there is, um, you know, in terms of what Rishi Sunak could have done, he could have suspended him pending an investigation. There are many other things that could have actually just showed that he took this seriously and he was going to act decisively. This has now dragged on and it looks like uh, Zahawi is not going to take this lightly as well. Has he been treated unfairly by the press? Oh, I think it's absolutely hilarious. It's now this sort of miscarriage of, of justice that, that we're, we're, we're seeing being put forward by Nadeem Zahawi. I mean, his... His letter was absolutely extraordinary. His letter basically said, I am a total legend and <laughs> I've basically been completely mistreated by the press. And, and there's a, a serious uh, message behind this. And I know you do a lot of work in terms of, of free speech and the freedom of the press. Dan Needle has been very clear here that actually the tax laws sort of worked in this He's case. a tax expert. It, it, it's, the, it's the libel laws and it's the fact that very rich, powerful men can try and use their money to, to come down on, on, on journalists. And, and he said it was all a smear and actually it's all been proven to be true. But the bigger problem now for Rishi Sunak, he may well have really wanted, as he stood on the steps of Downing Street, mm. to talk about accountability and integrity. He's got so many problems coming down the track. Dominic Raab is the next thing that people will be looking at. He's talking about the ministerial code. Suella Braverman was sacked because of breaching the ministerial code. Then within six days, she's back in under Rishi Sunak. If he is really going to follow this mantra of integrity and, and, and really believing in the ministerial code, then he has got to revisit Suella Braverman and he's got to be very tough with Dominic Raab. Do you agree? Well, I don't think... I think Suella... The point about Suella has already been made and... She the breached Prime the ministerial has, well, code. And, and that has been accepted under the previous... Sorry. She was um, left under Liz Truss's administration. For six and then, days. And no, and then the Prime Minister said she's decided to... You know, she's, she's owned up to her mistake and she won't do it again, and then he reappointed her on that basis. So do you think Nadeem Zahawi should be allowed back in if he says, look, I'm really sorry I shouldn't have done that? Do you think he should be allowed back in? Well, no, but that's not really the point. You've got to look at every individual circumstance. I don't think we should live in a world where in public life where if somebody makes a particular mistake, and I repeat, I'm not talking about Nadeem Zahawi, I'm talking more broadly, if somebody makes a mistake in public life, that means they're banished forever. I don't think that's a sensible view. The second point you made about Dominic Raab, there is an independent process going on right that's now... That's the Justice Secretary. To, to, ...to look at the Justice Secretary and, and allegations... And the 24, 24 uh, bullying allegations. allegations of bullying. Look, and then when that determination is made, mm. then there will be a judgment. But it's really, really important that we do not say, because there is a, a media storm about an individual or an issue, that that means the only way appropriately to deal with that is to fire the person in post without having the full facts, having an independent ethics advisor. I'm old enough to remember the Labour Party saying, why has the Prime Minister not appointed an ethics advisor? We appointed one. We've now got a process. And now they say, oh, no, he, we don't need the ethics advisor. The Prime Minister should just act. Yeah, but the, the, per, the ethics advisor is there to advise on complex issues where there is some ambiguity. This, is com this was complex. There is no ambiguity well, whatsoever about a person putting themselves forward to be Chancellor of the Exchequer well, when the they've got of, a five well, million... What's the point of having an ethics advisor, then? What was the point no, of the, the ethics, ethics advisor, in certain circumstances, it's right yeah. to, to use them, deploy them. All right. But, the, but it, you cannot... Also, can we also you, just... We have to look at the political reality of this, cool. which is we have a Prime Minister who stood on the steps of Downing Street, said professionals, integrity and accountability, well, mm. and on every single one of those it's being breached, and you, you've got to show some leadership, you've got to do the right thing, show but your also, government has a moral compass. Also, just really quickly on this, remember, we did have a situation where the independent ethics advisor under Boris Johnson did rule on cases like Priti Patel and bullying, and then they ended up having to leave their job. So ultimately, the buck stops with the Prime Minister. And they make the Prime, ultimate decision, don't they? And they make the they? ultimate what decision. A... And also, Rishi Sunak, well, allowing this to drag on for two cycles of Prime Minister's questions, has only undermined trust in his own party and trust in his own leadership. Can I go back to... You earlier um, on in the programme said, uh, Bim, that you felt perhaps one or two of the media stories were unfair on uh, Nadim Zahawi. Do, do you have some sympathy with what he said? Well... The point I was actually making is more broadly, sometimes media stories about politicians can be unfair, untrue or just plain wrong. In relation to Nadim, look, uh, very straightforwardly, I know him. Um, he's a friend. He's a very effective minister and politician. 
uh, in lots of different ways. The work he did on vaccines and other things has been really, really brilliant. But in this instance, the judgment was wrong and he was right to go. What Should I find extraordinary as well is that there wasn't a single word of apology or humility in his letter. And that is what worries me because that shows that the arrogance that we've seen, the arrogance of power, the complacency that comes with, and frankly, sleaze bordering on corruption in some cases that comes with this 13 years of power. When you read that letter, you think they haven't learned a single thing. Does it happen to all governments who are in power for, for too long, in your mind? Uh, the, the level of sleaze and um, scandal that we're seeing around this government is something that I can't recall in my in my sort of political well, adult lifetime. Well, at this point, um, there have been some suggestions, helpful or otherwise, Bim, as to who should replace Nadim Zahawi. Let's have, you, a, let's have a look. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm sure you can in the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> Boris Johnson tipped to become party chairman by Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, would you support that? I, 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 Jacob's a very fine colleague. I like him a lot. I, I think, I suspect this is unlikely to happen. Unlikely, but would you like to see it happen? No, not particularly. No. Have you got any ideas who might make a good party chairman? No. Um, <laughs> Putting yourself there are forward. All sorts of, no. We have someone all, right before us. There are all sorts of, of people who can do who can do an effective job. It's worth saying, just for mm. the people viewers who may not be fully appreciative what the party chairman does, it's a really, really complex role because it involves dealing with a lot of things in, within government, outside government. Um, that's one of the reasons why Nadim was very good at it, because it was hugely organisational. And it's difficult to find a good person, but I'm sure we will. Right. And we're, we're, we're doing the right thing, um, which is different to what happens most of the time in politics. We're actually taking a bit of time to find the right person. I think that's a good thing. Uh, should Nadim Zahawi retain the party whip, by the way? I mean, there have been calls for him from the, the Liberal Prime Democrats, been, admittedly, yeah. um, for him to, to stand down. I think that's just the Liberal Democrats trying to get in on the story somehow. Uh, the Prime Minister has been very clear that he... Um, has faith in Nadim to continue supporting the government from uh, from the back benches. All right, while we're talking uh, briefly about Boris Johnson, the former Prime Minister, he's revealed to the BBC that he felt personally threatened by the Russian President Vladimir Putin in the run-up to the invasion of Ukraine last year. Let's just take a listen. He said, Boris, you, you say that uh, Ukraine is, is not going to join NATO anytime soon. He said it in English, anytime soon. What is any time soon? And I said, well, it, it, it's not going to join NATO for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know that perfectly well. It, it, it fundamentally, it wasn't about, you know, he, he sort of, he threatened me at one point and said, you know, uh, Boris, I don't want to hurt you, but uh, with a missile, it would only take a minute or something like that, you know. What did you make of that? You know? Was Putin being serious? Well, I mean, you know, Putin is a, a, a thuggish... Uh, individual and is doing absolutely horrendous things. So I think, you know, I would, I would take all of those claims seriously. And I mean, we just talked about Boris Johnson potentially being the party chairman and so on. He he was right uh, to leave. And I think that that was a good thing. And many people agreed with that. But I think there was one thing that many people can also say that he showed profound political and moral leadership when it came to uh, Ukraine. And actually, Britain very much led the way in terms of uh, leading the world in a strong response to Putin. And so I think Boris Johnson could be admired for that. How would Keir Starmer stand up to Vladimir Putin? Well, we would clear the dirty money out of London for a start. We wouldn't be a party that's taken £4 million from uh, donors with very strong Russian connections, as the Conservative Party has done. Uh, we would ensure that we invest in our armed forces. Uh, we oh. would replace the 10,000 soldiers that have been lost uh, under the Conservatives. And we would also have, I think, a reality check around our broader defence strategy, which is that in the end, uh, the UK is a European power and we should be looking after our own backyard rather than going on some of the kind of rather, let's say, unrealistic aspects of global Britain, which I think underpinned the last uh, integrated review. But what did you make about the allegation there from Stephen about uh, Russian money and the uh, Conservative Party? Well, all the, all the donors to the Conservative Party are British citizens. You're not allowed to donate to a party, unless I'm wrong, and, uh, unless you're a British citizen. So because somebody happens to have a Russian name, I don't think they should be prohibited from supporting or any particular... married to a former Russian Hold finance on. minister. I, well, I, I, I think that if somebody's a British citizen and they have not been convicted of any crime, they should be allowed to, to participate fully in this country. All right. Uh, but just, you know, I have to hand it to Keir Starmer because he's managed, and I think this is an achievement, he has managed in the space of three years to get the same people, including himself, who were saying they wanted Jeremy Corbyn 
to be prime minister. This is the guy who is on record objecting to NATO, uh, objecting to the nuclear deterrent, everything. He's managed to get the same people, including Stephen and him, he himself, to now say, we're tough on defence, we're going to increase the number of our armed forces, we're going to have a broader European defence strategy. Never um, it's, it's some achievement, I must say. All right, say. well, I would say Putin versus the West series will be broadcast tonight. That's where that clip of Boris Johnson was from. Tonight on BBC Two at 9 o'clock, and it'll also be available on the iPlayer. Um, let's talk about county lines um, and a story uh, made by our colleagues at BBC Politics North. It's the story of one mum and her son's experience with county lines, gangs and drugs. He was a happy child, um, on the go, 100 miles an hour, um, cheeky chappy. He went into year 11 and, and knuckled down. He was then ready to do his exams until lockdown came in March. And then my whole world fell apart. Lockdown, he was supposed to be in, wasn't in, was going out, was going out coming home at all hours, wouldn't answer my calls, uh, just being absent from the home, not telling me where he was, secretive. I suspected things were going on in the home. I'd find little bits of um, weed and little bags. Um, he was arrested, which is the first time that the police came to the home. I, I, there were things in the house that I wasn't happy about, so I did get rid of. He came back from the police station and asked me where these um, things were, and I said, I've put them in the skip. And the fear in his face was horrendous, and it was alarm bells to me, something is not good. Police actually gave the debt for him because they searched his bedroom, they arrested him in, out and about, and take all the drugs off him. They then belonged to this perpetrator and they need, they need the money or the drugs back. He was beaten badly, which is a trauma that he's now living through. He came home and hid himself away um, and eventually he said, this is what you get by owing money. To see your child's face twice the size of what it should be, no mother should see. And then that's when I asked for some help. Didn't really get any help. Uh, a few weeks went by. I thought if he went into care, he would be looked after safely. He was then placed in a contained flat in the middle of where he was being exploited from. No supervision, no protection really, no money, you know, no benefits or anything um, and was there for four months, four or five months. When he was in that flat, did the exploitation continue? Absolutely, yeah. Or he was, he was still selling drugs um, and that's how he was funding living. But I look back and I think, is it tough love? I've given him tough love. Is he had to hit rock bottom before he... He got better. Just one phone call to him and I said, stop doing what you're doing and come home. If you don't, stop phoning me. And he came home two days later. So he, he was back home, but the repercussions have continued, haven't they? With the police and the uh, cases against him. He should be treated as a victim but that doesn't seem to be happening in, in the police res respect. He's lost a couple of jobs. He's suffering. He's not the boy of 11 or 12. Um, hopefully we'll get him back fully. A difficult story there. Let's talk to uh, Carl Morton, who works for St Giles's Trust, a charity which helps people, whether children or young people, being exploited in the way we have just heard as an example. Carl, uh, the mother in that film says that her son should have been treated as a victim and that that doesn't seem to be happening. Do you agree with her? Yep. 
Hundred percent, definitely agree. I think when you're looking at the police when they're raiding houses of a, a trap house or what professionals call a cool property, and they, they go in there and they find a amount of drugs and weapons and money, then they would treat that person as a perpetrator. However, what you have to think about is the weeks and months that that young person has been groomed. What we're saying is, is that young person is a, is a is a is a victim also. How would you change the law uh, at the moment? I mean, what would help in a clear way to situations like the one we've just heard? Well, I think, I mean, some of the, some, there's quite a few things that could change. I think a, a lot of people, the politicians are going to talk about modern day slavery acts and, and, mm. and child exploitation. The issue that you have with that is, is if you're talking about crown prosecution, not so much of police, when you're talking about a case where it's to do with, with, with the sale of drugs of county lines, then most of that information is gathered through telephone, telephone information, stuff like that, so they can prove that case. When it comes to modern-day slavery or human trafficking, anything like that, then that takes manpower. And I'm not saying the police are not putting forward that they want these young people to be, to be crossed over. But what they're going to do is you have a problem with the Crown Prosecution. The Crown Prosecution are the ones that are not going through with this. Yeah, and also, they're going to speak about the NRM, which is National Referral Mechanism. Mm -hmm. However, the National Referral Mechanism is so outdated. Originally, it was designed for human trafficking, and, which, and, and that was only designed for foreign victims of modern-day slavery, not this country. Right. What sort of things are children being asked to do by drug gangs? Well, you see, some of the things is, is, is to transport drugs. If we go down and do it in basics, if you look at the word of county lines, it's a government word that brought up you know, this phenomenon of seven, eight years ago, mm. which is the word of county lines. If you break down county lines into two parts, it's very simple. County, very simple. Control of drugs, moving drugs from county to county, region to region. The second part is lines, which means a phone line. So although the government came up with this new phenomenon, which is seven, eight years old of county lines, in reality, it's been going on as long as the phone lines have been going on. The only difference is, the, is what drugs have been transported across the country. And especially when you're looking at social media, um, the living conditions now, you have to look at some young people, and bearing in mind we're working with young people from year five, year six, into the safe transition into secondary school. Mm. There's an argument now for us to go as young as year four, which would be eight, really? nine years old. Gosh. Yes. All right, let's, um, let's ask the politicians for their views, but please stay with us, um, Carl. What about yeah. um, this principle that children like the boy that was described there by his mum being um, treated as a victim? It's very, very difficult because there'll be some instances, uh, and it may well not be the case in the mm. case that we've just heard, but there'll be some instances where punishment and uh, not treating them as a victim uh, is needed, but there'll be others where they should be treated as a victim. And, of course, what I'd like to see is that those two things not being an either or, and to be able to say somebody can need some sort of custodial sentence, but also to be worked with and to be understood and listened to so that we, we appreciate that they can have also been a victim in part as well. And we need to do both of those two things at the same time. Carl? No, what you're doing is straight away you're criminalising a young person. If that young person has been groomed, that person, therefore, that person has been led into a life that they, they had no option in doing. So what you want to do now is what you've just said is basically criminalise them, but then help them. So you criminalise a young person. Let's talk about if this young person is 15 years old, you're going to criminalise a young person at 15 years old. So when they decide and something happens future down the line, they want to change their life around, when they get into the 20s, they'll still have a criminal record. They're still going to have that criminal record. So you want to criminalise them even though they're a victim. All right. But well, you've, you've... You know, I, I think it is clear that when it comes to lots of the public services, education professionals, social workers, there needs to be much more joined up thinking in preventing young people getting to the point to which they're already drawn into criminal networks and gangs. But I do think we also have to be honest that, you know, county lines isn't in isolation. It's often also associated with incredibly violent crime, you know, sex trafficking, murder, the kinds of things that destroy entire communities. So whilst some of those young people um, may be uh, coerced or being exploited, that should, of course, be taken into account. But I don't think that um, necessarily just blanket seeing people that commit those crimes as victims is going to actually lead to the kinds of accountability and justice for some of those horrendous crimes. And I do think there is a kind of broader trend within society of when it comes to uh, 17, 16-year-olds, re recasting them that have committed things uh, as victims. We saw that with, you know, Shamima Begum. There are obviously complexities involved. But when people have been committing crimes that destroy 
entire communities. They, they must be held to account. Carl? Sorry, you, you said 16, 17-year-olds. We're talking as young as nine years old. No, I, and of course, as I said, that social services, parents and teachers should be involved to prevent that from happening. But I think when we talk about children, that also goes up to 16 and 17. So it's not just very, very young children. Stephen? Oh, no, oh, I, no. Go on, Carl. No. Go on, Carl. You respond. No, it's, I mean, some of the work that we're doing in school, so we, we work on a formula of the triangular approach. So that's working with young people in school, giving them, going through the grooming line so they'll be able to identify, <laughs> be able to see the signs. We also do professional sessions with parents. We also do professional sessions with teachers. So there we're, we're bridging the gap within the communities, within schools and education, because if a young person is in school full time, they will spend more time in education than what they actually do with the parents. Now, if a, if a teacher picks something up in school, automatically pick up the phone, phone parents, carers, and say, look, we've heard this discussion, therefore the parents, instead of being defensive, saying, oh, no, not my child, <laughs> they will know and have the same training. So, therefore, that person can be picked up a lot earlier. But, but what, what about if, it's, if they've also been involved in violent crime? Do you think that that should not be uh, charged? I mean, how far do you take the kind of treating them as victims? If you talk, are you talking county lines or are you talking just gangs in general? Well, it's all associated. It, they are, they are, they can be intertwined. And I do, I do agree with that. They can be intertwined. However, if you're looking at it, the same way within gangs, young people are still groomed into gangs. Some people, if you're looking at some, if you look at some um, postcode wars that have been going on for so many years, some of them are second generational. Some of these young people that are getting involved, where they're told, "Listen, you need to protect this area." They couldn't even tell you how it started. It's one of the things where they're drawn in because you're either with us or you're against us. Uh, Stephen, where are you in terms of criminalising um, or charging youngsters who commit crimes? Um, let's say they are under 16, but they are committing crimes um, versus treating them purely as a victim. The number one priority has to be to go after the hardened criminals who are doing the grooming and are the architects, if you like, of this whole broken system. They are uh, the people that are manipulating young people and grooming them. Um, what we need is a child exploitation register so we oh. can really go after, uh, make a grooming a criminal offence. Labour is committed to that. Get more um, community policing on the streets. We want to create police hubs in neighbourhoods so people can actually be much closer to the police on the ground and the police are more working with communities to uh, really go off. And then, of course, our criminal justice system is broken because re-offending rates are so incredibly high. So we've got to actually sort out the way that our prisons are working so that people aren't re-offending and learning uh, about the crimes that then get committed subsequently when they get back out onto the streets. I mean, it's an integrated approach mm. that's required. There's no, there's no silver bullet with this, Joe. But, but what, what I think we have to recognise is that it is the hardened criminals who are running the county lines gangs. They've got to be the priority in terms of the people. Well, I think everyone, I think everyone would agree well. with that. But you still have this collateral damage, if you want to call it like that, which is what happens to the young people that are lured or groomed, as Carl uh, says, into these gangs. If we're talking about people and young children as, as young as sort of nine or 10 or 11, um, they're unbelievably vulnerable. But agencies like schools have already got an awful lot to do. Well, I mean, the whole thing is incredibly shocking and, and you have to... There's two aspects to this. You have to primarily join up the dots. You know, why is it that an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old is having access to, to these people? Why is it that, that their parents are not, um, you know, helping to sort of stop this? Who is facilitating this kind of contact? So there's a lot of joining up the dots in terms of and by the way th this is it actually loops into the conversation we had earlier about sort of health as well you've got to have a joining up the dots process if you've got mums and dads who are working two three jobs they're hardly seeing their, their kids they're probably not knowing what's going on with mm -hmm. their kids as you say teachers right now are absolutely stretched to the limits teachers are expected to be social workers as well as providing sort of breakfast for, for, for some kids Everything feels like it's sort of freeing at the moment and there's some really dangerous consequences. But I do think we also can't be naive with older children, particularly if violence has been mm. caused. There will be another family whose child was, was, was beaten up as well and they will want to feel that their case is not just, you know, not, not proceeded with. So you have to, I think, tread carefully. Yes, if children are very, very young, it would be absolutely wrong to criminalise them. You have to, you have to sort of look at what's going on. But as children get older, you have to be compassionate, be common sense as well. And that's, by the way, what everyone in the community will want. Uh, Carl, last word from you. 
Um, I, I think you, a lot of it you've got based on. There's a lot of things, social media and the cost of living. Mm. You've got to understand if a young person asks parents or carers for £2 to go to the shop, that young person has already spent the £2 because they know what they want to spend it on. When someone's coming along who's groomed them and said to them, oh, I can give you X amount of money for moving this parcel from mm. here to there, yeah. what are they going to do? Carl Morton, thank you very much uh, for joining us. You can watch the whole of the Politics North special on the BBC iPlayer, where you can also find previous episodes of Politics Live, including conversations about arming Ukraine, the powers to police disruptive protests, and whether we should tax multi-millionaires more. Let's finish with this uh, headline. It's from the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Michael Gove is the Cabinet Minister. Uh, it says in this tweet, developers have today received contracts committing them to pay for repairs to unsafe buildings and have six weeks to sign. Uh, this is the story that Michael Gove has announced a much anticipated scheme to force property developers to pay to replace unsafe cladding from properties they were responsible for building. Let's talk to Giles Grover from Manchester Cladiators. We've talked to the group many times before on the programme. What's your reaction to what's been announced by Michael Gove? It's positive. It's a step forward. Are we any closer to the comprehensive solution that Michael Gove has to deliver? We're not sure yet. Um, not enough of the developers are covered by this pledge. The statistics reveal that weekend it's only actually about 11, 12% of buildings that are unsafe across the country that will be fixed. We still got to find out whether developers who have um, continually focused on um, their profits over our safety for years, whether they'll actually now do the right thing. So it's good, it's progress, but we're not, not, it's not the end of the scandal. What are you going yet. to do next? What's your group going to do next? Well, we've had regular engagement with um, Michael Gove, civil servants, the team. We need to actually see what the contract says now because it was published in July. Mm. There were concerns by the developers that oh, it will leave them open to un unlimited liabilities. We've had a lot of tough talk from Michael Gove that there's been no real changes and, and we should be protected now. We need to actually look down, drill into the detail. We need to also make sure that those developers now do what they say they're going to do and the government needs to enforce the terms of that contract strongly and harshly. And your story and where you are now? Oh, blimey. Um, so <laughs> I've, I've kind of been involved in this for sort of four, five and a half years. First found out my building's unsafe in um, August 2017. We've had some government funding, which we welcome. The project started in April 2021. It was due to finish last February. We've now been told that it won't be until July of this year that it'll actually be um, finished, but that's before the developer, Bellway, have to take over the remaining works. In the last 10 months, we've had one meeting with them. Yeah. We've tried to push for more meetings, but we haven't heard back from them. So we now need to focus on Bellway doing the right thing as they've pledged and hopefully will sign to do soon. Giles Grover, thank you very much. Bim, your response. Um, welcome, but very much a first step and not covering anything like all the unsafe uh, buildings still with cladding. Yeah, so... It doesn't cover everything, all the buildings, because there are some developers who are doing the right thing and are replacing uh, the unsafe cladding as time goes on. There's an, I think there's a, um, there's a debate in the House this afternoon on the issue, so I think a lot of the details will be teased out. But I, I know how strongly Michael feels about this subject. He's been working on it for a long time, working very hard on it. I just hope that this will finally get the developers to act. They, a lot of them have been dragging their feet. This is a way of forcing them to do it. It's frankly quite harsh. It's, it's something that you don't often find in, um, in public policy, but I support what we're doing, and we just need to make sure that we, we cover everybody who's found themselves in an impossible situation where they can't live somewhere and also they can't sell it. So uh, it's, you know, we've got to act as soon as we can. Um, there are only about 10, 20 seconds. Uh, do you welcome this? Well, obviously you'll welcome it, but do you think it'll go uh, far enough? It's welcome. It feels like too little too late. Five years, five, six years since, since Grenville, only 7% of the flats that need to fix have been, fi have been fixed. It's due to the revolving door of chaos that we've seen in the Tory government over the last years and months. For what happened mm. at Grenville. On that note, that's all we have time for today. I'll be back tomorrow with more Politics Live at 12.15. Bye-bye.